Does King James Video Ministries require a 10% tithe? <laughs> Actually, another way to say this would be, does the Bible require a 10% tithe? Because that's the subject we're going to look at, and I'm going to answer these people out there that have said that uh, I'm in it for the money, and that uh, this ministry, King James Video Ministries, is all about money. We're going to talk about that today. But I want to show you what the Bible actually teaches on this issue of a 10% tithe. Now, I can build up to this thing and show you scripture after scripture after scripture, which we will be doing. But I'm just going to, for those of you who are curious, I'm just going to answer the question right here at the beginning of the video. If you're stuck in your traditions, going to some building someplace, and you don't like to have your traditions questioned, well, you're probably not going to like this sermon because the fact of the matter is, the 10% tithe for today, uh, for Christians, is one of the most unscriptural heresies that's been taught. Okay? You say, well, then you don't have to give to ministries. I didn't say that. We'll get into that later. But a 10%, a forced, required 10% tithe is a doctrine of devils. I'm going to demonstrate that. Leviticus chapter 27 Let's look at some of this stuff about the 10% tithe. Leviticus 27 is where we're going to start out here. Some of the brethren try to say that there is no such thing as a 10% tithe in the Bible. That's a mistake. There is a 10% tithe, but we're going to see who it was directed at, and we're going to see what the tithe was. Leviticus 27, verse 30. Okay. Okay says here, verse 30, And all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree, huh, is the Lord's, it is holy unto the Lord. And if a man will at all redeem aught of his tithes, he shall add thereto the fifth part thereof. And concerning the tithe of the herd or of the flock, even of whatsoever passeth under the rod, the tenth shall be holy unto the Lord. He shall not search whether it be good or bad, neither shall he change it. And if he change it at all, then both it and the change thereof shall be holy, it shall not be redeemed. These are the commandments which the Lord commanded Moses for the children of Israel in Mount Sinai. Okay? Now I want you to notice a few things here. Does it say anything at all about that 10% tithe being money? No, it doesn't. Notice there... In uh, verse 30, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree, jump down to verse 32, of the herd or of the flock, animals and fruits and vegetables is what's going on there. That's the tithe, the 10%. It's not money. So how can you get a 10% of your paycheck before taxes? You know, how can you get that from the Bible? Well, let's continue on here. Okay? But notice before we move on to the next passage, notice verse 34 says, uh, These are the commandments which the Lord commanded Moses for the children of Israel. Are we the children of Israel? No. Okay? We're born in by a spirit of adoption, but we're not the children of Israel. We're going to talk about that as we continue here, but this is not for the church today. Just as when you read through the book of Leviticus and you see all these verses about animal sacrifice, you don't apply those literally to today. You say, well, that's what happened in the Old Testament. We're under a different system now. We are under the New Testament brought in by the death of the testator, Jesus Christ's death on the cross. Hebrews chapter 9, you can read about that. Now let's go to Genesis chapter 28. Genesis chapter 28 and verse 16. Genesis 28 verse 16 through 22. Okay. It says here, And Jacob awaked out of his sleep, and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. And he was afraid and said, How dreadful is this place! This is none other but the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. And Jacob rose up early in the morning and took the stone that he had put for his pillows and set it up for a pillar and poured oil upon the top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel. Okay, Beth meaning house, El 
like Elohim, you know, uh, El meaning God, so the house of God, Beth El, there. But the name of that city was called Luz at the first. And Jacob vowed a vow, saying, If God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go, and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on, so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then shall the Lord be my God. And this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tenth unto thee. Again, is this money? No, not necessarily. It's whatever God gives him, he's going to give back to the Lord a tenth of it. So, do we have that as instruction in righteousness? Yeah, you can make that argument. But doctrine? Doctrinally, it's not for a Christian today. Jacob, what's his other name that God gave him? God said, Israel is his other name. So, the children of Israel get the command about a tenth. Why? Because God first revealed it to Jacob. Okay? Well, I shouldn't say he first revealed it there. There's one other man that had it revealed to him. Okay, Genesis chapter 14. Let's go even further back in time. Genesis chapter 14. Again, I apologize for the construction noise in the woods here behind me. But uh, it's just the way it is. Hopefully you can't hear it too much. Genesis chapter 14, verse 17 through 24. It says here, And the king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Chedorlaomer and, and of the kings that were with him at the valley of Sheva, which is the king's dale. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the high priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand. And he, and he gave him tithes of all. And the king of Sodom said unto Abram, Give me the persons and take the goods to thyself. Okay, so let me just stop there for a minute. We're going to see in a minute here who the king of, or this uh, priest of Melchizedek, we're going to see who that is. But this king of Sodom, now you know the Old Testament, you know Sodom and Gomorrah was a bad place. Filled with sodomites. That's where the word came from. Okay, they call them today homosexual or gay, whatever. They're sodomites. That's the biblical word. So, these this king of Sodom, who was probably a sodomite himself, doesn't come out and say it, but you know he's a king of these this you know city of perverts, and he comes to Abram and he says, Hey, you know you really did a good job there. You know whipping all these bad guys that, that came and kidnapped people from Sodom. You know. And so, I'll tell you what, we'll split up the goods. Look what Abram says. Verse 22, And Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lift up mine hand unto the Lord, the Most High God, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take from a thread even to a shoe latchet, and that I will not take anything that is thine, lest thou shouldest say, I have made Abram rich. Save only that which the young men have eaten, and the portion of the men which went with me, Aner, Eshkel, and Mamre, let them take their portion. Now, this is going to be really important later on, this thing that Abram did there. And I'm going to tell you right now, if you're in ministry, there are certain people that you should never take donations from. Okay? We're going to talk about that later. But uh, Hebrews chapter 7, verses 1 through 5, I'll just read here quick. It says, For Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings, what we just read about there, and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all. So there again you see the tenth. First being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that king of Salem, which is king of peace. Peace. Without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. Now consider how great this man was, who unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of the spoils, and verily that it, they that are, excuse me, and verily they that are of the sons of Levi, who receive the office of the priesthood, have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law, that is, of their brethren, though they come out of the loins of Abraham. So again, you see there, this is a command, this tenth tithe 
tithe thing is a command to the children of Israel. It's not a command for a Christian today. All right? Very important to get that. But who was this priest after the order of Melchizedek? According to the scriptures there, it was Jesus Christ. Very interesting. A pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ. Was Jesus Christ on the earth physically before he came, you know, born of Mary? Yeah, he was. Okay? That's an interesting appearing of the Lord Jesus in the Old Testament. Okay? So somebody comes along and says, oh, Jesus isn't God. Yes, he is. Okay? Jesus always was God. Jesus wasn't created in the first century uh, in the sense of he just happened to be into existence then. No, he always was God. And he used to abide as the priest of God in that time period. Okay? Um, now you're gonna, we're going to get into some of these passages that these modern church building pastors are going to use on you if you're not giving regularly. And you know, I actually talked to a guy the one time and he said he visited a Methodist church and he said that if people weren't giving, tithing, you know, that they would actually take the people's names and put them up on a bulletin board. It's, in, it's incredible, yeah. You know, I mean, these, these people, you know, in these big buildings, you see, they're running a business. And if you're not a good customer, well, they'll put up the bad customers. Just like, you know, you go to some stores and they put up bounced checks, you know, of bad customers, you know. Same kind of thing with some of these church buildings. Hmm. But I'm going to show you some of the, these verses that they're going to go over. Now, here's the big one. Malachi chapter 3. The very last book in your Old Testament there, Malachi chapter 3. I'm going to show you this is the favorite one of the modern day pastor who likes the Lord over the flock. Malachi chapter 3, we'll start at verse 7. Okay? It says here, Even from the days of your fathers ye are gone away from mine ordinances, and have not kept them. Return unto me, and I will return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. But ye said, Wherein shall we return? Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, Wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the, not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, and there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground. Neither shall your, your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. And all nations shall call you blessed, for ye shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. You say, you know, I can't ask for a show of hands here because I can't see you raising your hand, but I would like to say how many of you have seen this thing where you've been in a church building and the pastor there says, if you're not tithing 10% of your income, then you are robbing God and God's curse is upon you. And then they'll quote that portion of Scripture right there. I've seen it happen. I've been in church buildings where they have done that. Why? Because they're running a business. They need to have that income. But let's look at a couple points here. Okay? Look at verse 7. Even from the days of your fathers. Who are the fathers there? You say, oh, that's, uh, you know, the church fathers in the first century. Uh, no. That would be the, Jew, the Jews, the, the children of Israel. That's who the fathers are there. Again, who is the Lord addressing? He's addressing the Jews who were given commandments to tithe. Okay? It's right there. Verse 10 refers to mine house. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. What is the house of the Lord today? 1 Corinthians 3.16 says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy. Which temple ye are? It's kind of interesting because 
one of the marks of a false preacher is that they speak good words and things and fair speeches and it says that they serve their own belly. Huh. It's kind of interesting because you'd have like these a modern day pastor and he's saying about you got to bring the tithes into the storehouse into mine house you know. Well the temple of God is your body so that big overweight preacher up there you know walking around with a cathedral ceiling sticking out you know and he's taking all the tithes and bringing them into the storehouse. He's serving his own belly. You know. Kind of interesting. But the fact of the matter is in all seriousness there is no holy temple of God right now, some physical building that we can go to that needs to be supported with our money that we are commanded to give a 10% tithe to. That's not scripture. Okay? In the Old Testament, yes. But you see these hypocrites, they'll go back to the Old Testament to prove tithing, but they won't go back to the Old Testament to prove animal sacrifice. All these people that say, you are required to give a 10% tithe, not one of them is ever going to say, Oh, sister so-and-so just had a boy. Well, bring in your turtle doves. we got to sacrifice them. You know? Hey, we need a lamb without blemish and without spot to sacrifice it. They're not going to do that. Why would they go back and do the tithe thing? Well, because of 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10. The love of money is the root of all evil. But we'll continue here. Okay? Number three there in verse 12, it says, All nations shall call you blessed. God is dealing with a nation in the book of Malachi, chapter 3. Okay? He is not dealing with the church. The church is not a nation. Okay? God's no respecter of persons right now. And let me make a point here. You say, well, why did they have a required tithe back then? because you were dealing with a physical building and they were building a physical kingdom on the earth. So it would be like a tax. You would have to have a 10% required tithe back at a time like there in the Old Testament when God was dealing with the nation of Israel. You would have to have that kind of commandment because they were dealing physically. Today we are dealing spiritually. Christians are not supposed to be building a kingdom on this earth. We're not supposed to be building big temples and calling them Christian. We're not supposed to be doing that. Okay? And let me ask you another question. For those of you who are saying, I believe that we should have this 10% tithe. Okay. What would have been the point in time in the Old Testament when they would have been the most wealthy? Probably under the reign of King Solomon. I mean, you read back then, he's making up into the billions of dollars in physical gold, not phony numbers on a computer or fiat currency. No, he was making in physical gold, he was making billions of dollars. They had a lot of money right then. And that's when the temple was built and it was all the stuff's overlaid with gold and all kinds of stuff. I mean, just a, a, a magnificent temple that King Solomon built to the Lord, you know, and consecrated it and they're sacrificing hundreds of thousands of animals and stuff. Uh, well then, when that time happened and they were really giving the 10% tithe and all that, did that ensure that the children of Israel lived holy? No. Actually, what happened as a result of that great temple that was built, they ended up, by the time Solomon got old, he was worshiping other gods in that temple. Hmm. You mean to tell me that a man could build a building and in his lifetime that building could change and turn and start to worship other gods? Oh yeah. Regardless of whether or not the people were given a 10% tithe. And in fact, I would say, because they were giving a 10% tithe, it became about money, and they started to worship mammon instead. You see, if you're the pastor of a church, and you have members of your congregation that are bankers and lawyers, and doctors, and you realize they're giving, they're making $120,000 a year, we'll say. Let's see, what would 10% be? Well, that'd be $12,000 a head. I mean, a, a, a congregant, you know? And you start to figure it out. Well, guess what you're going to do? Are you going to preach hard on the sins of the doctors and lawyers and politicians and, you know, bankers and things? Are you going to preach against them? 
Or are you going to get, preach against the people that are not tithing, that are not faithful tithers? You know, you start to tiptoe through the tithers, you know, because you don't want to offend the rich people that are bringing in the most money. You see how the system is corrupt? You know, you get somebody that comes and visits and stuff and they're, and you know that they, you know, they drive in in a Mercedes or a, a BMW or some kind of very expensive car. And what do these preachers do? They drool all over them. Oh, we're so thankful to have you here. Oh, brothers. Oh, oh boy, you know, what, what would you like to have me preach on, you know? What, can I kiss your shoes for you? But you have some guy driving an old beat-up pickup truck that's 20 years old or something, and you go, oh, you know, he's not dressed all that well. You know, his wife isn't dressed that well either. And uh, I saw when the offering plate got, plate got passed, they didn't even put anything in. Ugh. See? You start to become partial in yourselves. Why? because of the offering. Don't you tell me for one second that that doesn't go on. I got more sense than that. Okay, I've been around Christians for a long time. I've seen how the game works. I've been in the big buildings where you get the people that are donate, donating the big amounts of money and they start to pull the strings. And the pastor starts to be the little puppet there, the little marionette on the strings and the rich people are up above him going, say this, preach on that, don't preach on this. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. The rich people rule the church. Why? Because of the tithe. Can that system be abused? Absolutely. How about this one? How about the widow's mite? You know, you get people that aren't giving and the pastor can just stand up there and he can talk about the widow's mite. You know, he can look down at people that are barely making ends meet financially and he can say, what about the widow's mite? I mean, when you're poor, you should be giving even more money. Let's look about that story. Matthew chapter 12, or I'm sorry, not Matthew, Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12, verse 41. And Jesus sat over against the treasury and beheld how the people cast money into the treasury and many that were rich cast in much. It's like we were talking about. And there came a certain poor widow and she threw in two mites which make a farthing. And he called unto his disciples and saith unto them, Verily I say unto you that this poor widow hath cast more in than all they which have cast into the treasury. For all they did cast in of their abundance, but she of her want did cast in all that she had, even all her living. Now the preachers here, they get all excited with us and they say, you got to give to the Lord until it hurts. If you have to go without food, then you better give to the work of the Lord, you know, and, and everything. And they're saying that to the people who are having problems that are unemployed many times or having financial difficulties and the pastors there are making $100,000 a year. You know, I know of a Baptist church in this area where the pastor's making, I think it's, I think they said it was about Fifty-five, sixty thousand dollars, and his wife works at a bank. The two of them are making a hundred thousand dollars a year, and they're telling people they were telling women, young mothers, they were saying, "You need to go get a job so that you can support this ministry." Dirty, rotten, crooked, stinking reprobates is what they are. They're in it for the money. They're hirelings, okay? A hireling has no love for the sheep. Why is the hireling there? Before, because of the money. It's like an employee at a job and the, the, he's there and he's working and he doesn't do a very good job. He's just kind of there putting in his time, you know, because he's salaried or something. And all of a sudden the building catches on fire and he takes off and runs and gets out of there. Saves his own skin. That's a picture of what a hireling is in the New Testament. John chapter 10 talks about a hireling that when the wolf comes, he flees because he's a hireling. And that's what these modern day preachers do. A wolf comes along, problems come. I'm going to tell you right now, brethren, you are going to see, if the Lord tarries, you are going to see these church buildings having rules clamped down on them. 
that they're gonna have to perform sodomite marriages, you're gonna see things coming to this country and you are gonna see firsthand the hirelings tucking tail and running as fast as they can away from the sheep. And they're gonna drop those sheep and those poor sheep are going, what do we do now? Where are we gonna to go to church at? You shouldn't have been going in the first place. You should have learned to fellowship with the Lord at home. Meet with some other Christians, have a Bible study. Oh, but I can't have a legitimate relationship with Jesus Christ outside of a church building. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. And yes, you better. Because the church building time is coming to an end. Soon. Very, very, very soon. And if you don't have that right relationship with Jesus Christ between you and Him, if you don't have that, you're not going to know what to do. Because the hirelings in the building, when... The, you know, you get a bunch of big burly guys from FEMA or from the FBI or the CIA or something like that, and Mr. Pastor there is in his little suit and tie in his office preparing this week's sermon, and bang, bang, bang on the door, and he comes to the door, and oh, there's these big guys, these agents, and he says, uh, uh, can I help you? Uh, yeah, we're here to tell you what you're going to preach in the future. You know? Well, I, I, I think I have freedom. I have the First Amendment. You don't have it anymore. We own your building. It's called 501c3. You signed up way back when? We own the building. Now, hireling, you're going to do what we tell you to do. You're going to preach what we tell you to preach. It happened in Russia. It happened in China. It's happened all over the world. Oh, but never in America, right? Yeah, right. You're going to see it soon. Okay? But you see that thing there, you know, of this widow's might. But let's continue here. Let's look at the context of this passage. Mark chapter 12, verse 38 through 40. And he said unto them in his doctrine, Beware of the scribes which love to go in long clothing and love salutations in the marketplaces and the chief seats in the synagogues and the uppermost rooms at feasts, which devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. These shall receive greater damnation. Who are the ones that are putting most of the money? money into the treasury. The rich people, the scribes, the Pharisees, they were preaching false to steal the money from the poor. That's what they were doing. Okay? He was rebuking, Jesus Christ was re rebuking this corrupt temple system. Okay? That's what he was rebuking there. He wasn't telling Christians that you need to have a building and you need to put your all your money into it so that you're not even eating. We're going to see that later. Mark chapter 13, verses 1 and 2. It says here, And as he went out of the temple, now look at this compared to the modern day Christians. And as he went out of the temple, one of his disciples saith unto him, Master, see what manner of stones and what buildings are here? Oh, Master, look at this. Look at this huge big temple that we've built. The Baptist temple, the first independent Baptist temple of such and such. The first this and that. Look at this big building. We're building a wing on this coming year. Look at how this big thing is. Look at that. What's Jesus' reaction? Verse 2, And Jesus answering said unto him, Seest thou these great buildings? These great buildings that you think so much of? There shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. You see, the true system of tithing, 10% tithing, that was instituted upon the children of Israel and was carried out in that temple that Solomon built, that true system of the tithe and the temple that was built as a result, Jesus looks at it all and he says, I'm not impressed by this. They're no longer serving me in here. They have made the house of God a den of thieves, another part there. He says it and he drives out the money changers. What was going on? It had turned into a business. And so Jesus Christ said, that's not of me. That temple system is not of me. I have nothing to do with that. Okay, see that temple? This temple that you think so much of? It's going to be thrown down. And it was not that many years after, probably about you know, 40 or so years after, it got knocked down. Okay, Jesus gave a prophecy, it came to pass. And in the future, when the Jews rebuild their temple and the Antichrist sets up in the thing, he's going to cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease halfway through the thing. And then he's going to set himself up in that temple and cause people to worship him. And Jesus Christ is going to come back again and destroy it again. 
The Lord just doesn't think a whole lot of man-made temples. That's why Stephen said in Acts chapter 7, Howbeit the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Okay? More on that later. Okay? How about another one that they'll use? These modern church building pastors, they'll use this one. They say, you know, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's and unto God the things that are God's. Right? I mean, God owns your money and if you're withholding it from God, then you're withholding His blessings from you and you have to render those things that are God's to God. Let's look about that. Mark chapter 12, verses 13 through 17. And they sent unto him certain of the Pharisees and of the Herodians to catch him in his words. And when they were come, they say unto him, Master, we know that thou art true, and carest for no man, for thou regardest not the person of men, but teachest the way of God in truth. They're buttering him up, you know. Is it lawful to give tribute to Caesar or not? Shall we give or shall we not give? But he, knowing their hypocrisy, said unto them, Why tempt ye me? Bring me a penny, that I may see it. And they brought it, and he saith unto them, Whose is this image and superscriptions? And they said unto him, Caesar's. And Jesus answering said unto them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. Okay? What is Jesus actually condemning there? Jesus is actually condemning giving money to ministry when you yourself are living in sin. What are the sacrifices that they should have been giving to the Lord? A boat broken in a contrite spirit. Humility, holiness, righteousness. Those are the things that belong to God. You think God's up there in heaven going, boy, I, my treasury's getting a little bit low right now. I, I really wish somebody would send me a couple hundred dollar bills or maybe some 50s or 20s. Or, I'd even take some one dollar bills right now. Do you think the Lord cares about our stupid little money down here? You know, take a take a gold eagle, a one ounce gold eagle, you know, worth thirteen hundred dollars or so right now. One ounce gold eagle, and take it to God and say, "You're impressed, aren't you?" And the Lord looks around him and he's like, "I walk on gold here in heaven. You got mansions built of gold. Yeah, I'm impressed by your one ounce of gold. Woo, whoop de doo. You know, the Lord's not impressed by that." He's not saying, I want that money. I want that money. Bring that money in here. What Jesus Christ is saying in that passage is, hey, you want to pay your taxes? Pay your taxes. It's Caesar, you know. Pay your taxes to Caesar. Who cares? But if you're not giving to the Lord a pure life, a life of sanctification, a life of conse consecration, a life of righteousness and holiness, God's not interested in what you're given. God's not interested in what kind of money you have because it's not coming from God. It's coming from your crooked dealings with the world. So don't let them use that one on you either. Okay? Now this is another one that can be used two ways. And that is this statement, freely have received, freely give. Now that can be, that can be one of two ways. First of all, it's been used on me a lot to cut on me saying that I should be freely giving away everything that I make. We'll talk about that later. But that's one way it can be used. The other way is God's given to you freely. He's given to you the gift of salvation free. He's given to you your job, your health, everything else. So you should freely give to God without restraint. Okay? Now let's look at the problem with that. Matthew chapter 10, verse 5. Matthew chapter 10. Now remember, a text without a context is a pretext. Very important to get that. So let's look at the context here, what's going on in Matthew chapter 10. Verse 5. These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not. Again, brethren, if you are not rightly dividing the word of truth, how do you reconcile this? See, they're in the Old Testament doctrinally. And Jesus says, don't go to the Gentiles. At least not yet, you know. That happens later. 
Verse 6, But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and as ye go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. We don't preach the kingdom of heaven today. The kingdom of heaven is a physical, visible, earthly, literal kingdom. We don't preach that. Now here it is, verse 8. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely ye have received, freely give. Huh, I wonder how they missed the first part of that verse. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Uh, why would you just quote the last part of the verse and not quote the first part of the verse? See, is this for today? No. But this thing of, you know, you have to give away everything that you do in ministry, you should never make any money. Because freely have received, freely give. Well, let's look about that. <clears throat> verse 9. See here, verse 9. Uh, Provide neither gold nor silver nor brass in your purses nor script for your journey, neither two coats, neither shoes, nor yet staves, for the workman is worthy of his meat. And into whatsoever city or town ye shall enter, inquire who in it is worthy, and there abide till ye go thence. And when ye come into an house, salute it, and if the house be worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it be not worthy, let your peace return to you. And whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear your words, when ye depart out of that sit, house or city, shake off the dust of your feet. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. What's going on there? Well, what is happening is, Jesus is not saying to them, you are not allowed to take any kind of money or any kind of payment for your preaching. It's not what he's saying. He's saying don't take physical money, but room and board. Those people are supposed to take you into their house and cook for you. So it's not quite this thing of freely you have received, freely give. That's not there. Okay? In terms of you're not to have any kind of pay for what you're doing here. Free room and board is not the same thing as not taking any money at all. Don't be deceived by this modern apostate movement. Okay? But again, you can't force a tithe on anybody from that verse. Okay, what are the rules for Christians today when it comes to a 10% tithe? Do ministries, do you owe a ministry 10% of your income? Let's look about that. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6. First Corinthians chapter nine, verse six. It says here, or I only and Barnabas, have not we power to forbear working? What does the word forbear mean? It means to cease, to stop, to not do. So what Paul is saying there is he's saying, me and Barnabas, we have power to not work. We have power to be in ministry, and you people should support us. That's what Paul's saying there. Let's continue on. We'll see how this thing is defined. Verse 7 uh, through 14. Let's read that. Who goeth a warfare any time at his own charges? Who planteth a vineyard, and eateth not of the fruit thereof? Or who feedeth um, the, a flock, and eateth not of the milk of the flock? Yeah, absolutely. You don't go to war and provide your own gun and ammunition and uniform. You don't do that, okay? Somebody else pays for that. When we have wars, the American taxpayers pay for the weapons that our soldiers use. Obviously, okay, we wouldn't have much of a military if it wasn't that way. Well, when you have a man that's preaching, going out and warring out there, you don't say, hey, you provide everything for yourself. It doesn't work. How about, uh, planteth a vineyard and eateth not of the fruit thereof. You have a man who starts a ministry and that ministry starts to get known and more and more people start to, to know about the ministry and start to, they're bearing, you know, they're, they're the fruit of the ministry. They're getting saved. They're getting turned to the King James Bible and all this other stuff. But that man's not allowed to eat any of that fruit. That man's not allowed to have the fruit say to him, we want to support you so you can stay in this thing. Doesn't make any sense. Or how about feedeth the flock and eateth not of the milk of the flock? The milk is the blessing that the flock receives. Okay? So the Lord blesses you with money. You feed the guy that fed you. Okay? 
You wouldn't go into a restaurant and sit down and order a big meal and walk out without paying your bill. See, that's what's being illustrated here. You say, well, then we, we're, 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 I'll get my mouth to work yet. You say, then we're required to give a 10% tithe. I didn't say that. Let's continue reading. Okay. Verse 8, Say I these things as a man, or saith not the law, the same also. For it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Doth God take care for oxen? Or saith he it altogether for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt, this is written, that he that ploweth should plow in hope, and that he that thresheth in hope should be partaker of his hope. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? Money, in other words? Okay, verse 12, If others be partakers of this power over you, are not we rather? Nevertheless, we have not used this power, but suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. Verse 13, Do ye not know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple, and they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar? Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. It's right there. You say, well, Paul didn't use those things. Well, we're going to see about that in a little bit here. But the fact of the matter is, it is perfectly fine for a ministry to make money by donations from the people that it blesses, the people that it feeds. All right? That's what's being written there. You say, well, why don't you get a job? You know, I've had that put on me. Why don't you get a job? You know, Brian Dennett, you're so lazy. Get a job. Okay? Let's look about that. Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6. Verse 1. Acts chapter 6, verse 1 through 8. It says here, And in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews, because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Okay, nobody was taking care of their widows, the older women there. Verse 2. Then the disciples called the multitude of the disciples, or then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them, and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Did you know that ministry takes a lot of time? It does. And when you have to go out and you have to do other things, you have to leave that ministry. You have to leave the word of God and go out and serve tables, so to speak. Okay? Continuing here, verse 3. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business, the care of widows, in other words. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. You see, that's the job of a real man in ministry. You give yourself continually to the ministry. You see a guy that God is using, God is blessing, and you say, that guy should stay in ministry continually. And I'll have to be spending 40, 50 hours a week doing something else. Okay? But we'll continue here. Verse 5. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Procurus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. And the word of God increased. And the number of the disciples multitude in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Okay? So, notice a few points here. Number one, if a ministry is actively preaching, only work, other work will only cause them to leave the Word of God, like I said earlier. Number two, a real minister is one that gives himself continually to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. All right? That's there. I heard some thunder. The Word of God will increase under a true ministry. And a true ministry will also increase the number of disciples of Jesus Christ. Okay? So those are the things there that you should look for. But now let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. First Corinthians chapter nine verse fifteen. It 
Now we're going to see why Paul did not use this power that he had to forbear working. Why did he not use it on the Corinthians? Now remember what Abram said to King, the king of Sodom. Remember that. Remember he said, I don't want to take anything from you lest you say that you were the one that made me rich and not the Lord. Remember that. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 15 through 19. But I have used none of these things, neither have I written these things, that it should be so done unto me. For it were better for me to die than that any man should make my glorying void. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me, what is my reward then? Verily, that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my power in the gospel. For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. What's being taught there is, there are certain people you shouldn't take money from. And these Corinthians were very, very carnal, very wicked people. And Paul was simply saying, I'm not going to take money from these people. Now, I'm going to talk more about that later on as we get into this study. But Abram didn't take money from the king of Sodom because that guy was wicked. Paul didn't take money from the Corinthians because they were wicked. You say, well, you know, Paul didn't take money for his ministry. You know, show me one verse of scripture where Paul took money for being in ministry. Okay? Philippians chapter 4. Turn to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 through 19. Okay, now look at this. Okay, Paul does take money from believers. Read, let's read here. Uh, Philippians 4.10 But I rejoice in the Lord greatly, that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein ye were also careful, but ye lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to, be, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Notwithstanding, ye have well done that ye did communicate with my affliction. Now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. For even in Thessalonica, ye sent once and again unto my necessity. Not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. Notice that. Verse 18, But I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Okay? Now we need to notice a few things there. Paul was, first of all, we need to see, Paul was content to abound and to suffer need because he was doing the work of Jesus Christ. Now, as a true minister of Jesus Christ, you'll feel that, okay? There are going to be times when you're like, I don't think I want to be able to pay this bill coming up. You know, you, you are suffering need. Other times you're going, wow, you know, all these brethren are donating to the ministry. Praise the Lord. I mean, wow, I can really get this stuff done now. You'll learn how to abound and to suffer need, okay? A real minister is one that gives himself continually to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. Okay? The Philippians approached Paul about giving and receiving. Notice Paul was not coming to them and saying, could you please give me some money? Paul was not the one that was saying, give me money. They were the ones that communicated with him on the subject of giving and receiving. Now, let me give you a little story there to kind of illustrate my point. Back when I first got into ministry, I had a brother from Australia and he said, you know, about how he was so blessed by my ministry, and he said, I'd like to donate to your ministry. And I was like, well, brother, just donate your time in prayer. He said, no, Brian, I know that you need money, okay? I want to donate financially to your ministry. Put up some kind of a PayPal link or some kind of way I can donate. No, brother, I don't, you know, I appreciate the, the fact. I, I am honored by that, but just pray for the... And he kept, he kept pressing me and pressing me and pressing me on the subject of giving and receiving. Finally, I got a PayPal donation thing. You know, I don't make my ministry about begging for money. 
I shouldn't have to. If you see the Lord working through me, if you see, hey, I can give money to this guy and that will make fruit come back to me, spiritual fruit, well, I think I'm going to donate to this guy. That's the way it works. Okay? And that's what the Philippians were doing with Paul. Okay? And it's funny because I just, like I said there, the fruit of Paul's labors actually abounded to their account. They were the ones that were actually making money from it. Same way if you would invest in stocks. You might not actually work at the company that you're invested in, but when they do good, so do you. That's how it works spiritually. Okay? Now, do we owe a 10% tithe today? You see there that the Bible does teach a thing of giving to a good ministry, giving to a legitimate ministry. Do we owe 10%? Is it a forced 10% tithe? 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Second Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6. It says here, But this I say, He which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Now a lot of these charismatics and a lot of these false preachers, they love to quote that verse. You know, they love that. But they don't often quote the next one. Because you see, the next one kind of debunks the required tithe. Look at verse 7. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth the cheerful giver. Your giving is not of necessity. You are not required to give 10% of your income. Let's continue. Verse 8. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. As it is written, he hath dispersed abroad, he hath given to the poor, his righteousness remaineth forever. Now he that ministereth seed to the sower, both minister bread for your food, and multiply your seed sown, and increase the fruits of your righteousness, being enriched in everything to all bountifulness, which causeth through us thanksgiving to God. So again, you are giving seed to the sower when you donate to a ministry. And then he goes out there and he's sowing the seed, and that fruit that comes from that abounds to your account. That's the purpose of the thing. Okay? But you see there, it is not of necessity. You need to get that. Okay? And notice there too, it says, God loves a cheerful giver. Not somebody who's guilt-tripped into it by their pastor, who's overzealous. Okay? Now, for, imagine, if you will, for a minute, that you have a field, say a thousand acres, and you need to go out and you need to sow seed in that field. And you say, I'm just going to do it myself. I'm not going to try to pay other people to help me with that sowing of the seed. And the Lord blesses you with money. It's not that you don't have money. You have the money. But you say, I'm just going to keep it to myself. I'll keep the ministry to myself. And I'll keep the blessings of the Lord to myself. Couldn't you do better if you employed maybe 100 people to go out and sow that seed with you? See? The more seed that you get sown here on earth, the better your rewards are going to be when you get to heaven. And that's the purpose in giving to a godly ministry. You're multiplying your seed sown. So your money is going to come in better. Your heavenly riches are going to be laid up quicker. Because they're out there doing things, you know, that you can't do. You know, I had a sister over in the UK the one time, and... The Lord placed it in her heart to give me a donation, and it was a, it was a good donation, you know, and, and she didn't even know it, but at that same time, my backup camera, the one I would use for my overhead camera shots when I'd do a book review or something, that overhead camera was going bad, and I needed, I desperately needed a new camera, but I had no way of getting it. And at that same exact time, God placed it in that sister's heart to give me the money, and I went and I bought that camera. Well, that means that every time somebody watches one of my videos where I used that camera that she supplied the money for, and they see things and they get converted, the fruit of that actually goes to her, too, as well as me. I've had other brothers and sisters that at very critical times of my ministry, 
the Lord places a burden on their heart and they say, you know what, I'm going to send Brian a donation. And I use that money to further the work of the Lord. I mean, you know, there's a lot of fruit coming from this ministry. And there are brethren that can see that and there are brethren that say, I want to help out Brother Brian because there's fruit being born. I want part of that. You know? I mean, if nobody ever donated, well, I'll just plot along through the thing. But, you know, this is a good ministry to donate to. And I'm going to talk about that as we continue. Now, are you forced to give if you are having financially difficult times? I get that sometimes people say, Brother, I'd like to give to your ministry, but I just can't right now. I feel really guilty about it. Don't feel guilty about it. Look over at 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 5. Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, how that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. For to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power they were of themselves, praying us with much entreaty that we would ministering to the saints. And this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave to us by the will of God. Being poor is not uh, always an excuse to not give to the Lord's work, okay? Now, if, it, if you are being faced with a situation where you can't put food on the table, well then, you know, take care of your family. The Bible says if you don't provide for your own, you're worse than an infidel and you've denied the faith. So, don't say, oh, i got to give to the Lord's work this week, kids. We're not going to be able to eat. Don't do that, you know. But the point is, some people can use that as an excuse, you know. But you see those people there that gave out of their poverty, their deep poverty, Paul was actually bearing witness to their spiritual power. Kind of like the widow that gave the two mites. You know, she was the one that had the real spiritual power, not the Pharisees, not the doctors of the law. So, you know, that, it is there, okay? But uh, look at verse 8, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 8. He says here, I speak not by commandment, but by occasion of the forwardness of your others, and to prove the sincerity of your love. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. That's a good picture of a real preacher. A real preacher will give up careers and riches and all kinds of things, so that through his poverty, through his rough financial times, other people can become rich. Verse 10. And herein I give my advice, for this is expedient for you, who have be begun before not only to do, but also to be forward a year ago. Now therefore perform the doing of it, that as there was a readiness to will, so there be may be a performance also of, that also of that which ye have. For if there be first a willing mind, it is accepted according to that a man hath, and not according to that he hath not. For I mean not that other men be eased and ye burdened, but by an equality, that now at this time your abundance may be a supply for their want, that their abundance also may, may be a supply for your want, that there may be equality. As it is written, he that had gathered much had nothing over, and he that had gathered little had no lack. Okay? There is supposed to be some equality within the body of Christ. And you have this system that's totally out of whack now, here at the end of the church age, where you have pastors making $100,000 a year, and you have Christians that are unemployed. And the pastor who's living high on the hog up there in the, behind the pulpit is looking down, literally and figuratively, looking down on the Christians down there and he's saying, you're not giving enough to this church. You're not right with God. You're robbing God. You're under God's curse because you're robbing God. Uh, no, there's supposed to be equality. Okay? Let me just say a couple things here in closing. What are the financial goals of King James Video Ministries since I've been accused of being in this thing for the money? First of all, all of our videos that I produce are copyright free. You can take any DVD that I've ever made and you can make copies of it and copies of it and copies of it and give it to as many people as you want. I'm not in it for the money. Secondly, I never monetize any of my videos, although I could if I wanted to. I don't monetize my videos on YouTube. That'd be another source of income 
but I'm not going to take money from the lost. Remember like the king of Sodom with Abram? I'm not taking money from Google or from YouTube. Not going to happen. Number three, I personally counsel hundreds of people through email for free. See, you don't see that when you're here on YouTube. You don't see the time that I spend in email where I'm counseling people all the time. Emailing and emailing and emailing. I, I email six, eight hours a day sometimes. You know, it's a lot of work. Oh, but you ought to have a nine to five job, Brian. You ought to be working 40, 50 hours a week. Okay, then the ministry goes under. It's just as simple as that. Okay? I mean, the Lord brought me a wife and she helps me with the ministry as much as she can. She's got stuff to do too. You know, I don't have a, a, a film crew or something like that. It's me. Most of the work. Number four, we are currently searching for land in the mountains so we can build a home and try to be debt free. That's what we're doing. We're not even looking for a big, huge, big house someplace that I can, you know, live it up and stuff like that. No. I want to buy land and then the skills that the Lord has taught me over the years, I want to build a little house. You know? That's what I want to do. It's not going to be elaborate at all. You know? And we're going to live very, very simple. The Lord has been teaching us how to live very simple so that we don't need much money to live. Okay? Number five, we desire to continue this ministry until the rapture, and we are reaching thousands of people every day. Literally thousands of people. Okay? I don't talk about it a whole lot because I don't want to be a bragger, but the, the point is there are people that are contacting me and saying, Brother, I've been listening to you for three months now, and... I've been in church for 30, 40 years and never learned what I've learned from you in three months. People saying my life is entirely changed by your ministry, Brian. That blows me away. I, I step back and go, you know, me? I'm, me? God's actually using me? You know, I'm not a, I don't consider myself to be some great intellectual giant or something like this. The Lord works through me. One of the reasons is because I don't compromise. You know, and I, I don't, shun away from talking about any subject out there. I'll preach it. You know, I'm not trying to be a jerk. I'm just trying to tell the truth. So I want to continue the ministry. And you say, well, Brian, what happens if the ministry, you, what if happens if you can't continue it? Well, then I'll go back to my secular job where I made more money. People think I'm lazy. And I can tell you right now, if you think I'm lazy, you're quite foolish. Uh, right now, it's in the 90s out here. I'm standing here, I'm sweating like crazy. Um, two days ago, my wife and I were out here sawing and splitting firewood. 95 degree temperatures. I had a horrible, horrible headache because I didn't have enough salt in my diet throughout the day. I sweated so much, you know, there's a medical term for it, I don't remember what it was, but you know, you don't have enough salt in your diet, the cells in your body will actually absorb water and they'll swell that happens in your brain, you get a really bad headache, you know. And I had a horrible headache, barely slept at all that night, you know. I didn't, I wasn't smart enough to have enough salt in my diet, you know, throughout the day. I drank like about a gallon and a half of water while I was out here, but, you know, just wasn't smart enough to have enough salt. But I'm not afraid of work. I'm not afraid of manual labor. I've worked in logging, okay. I'm not afraid to get a job. All right. In many ways, it'd be easier than this ministry. Okay. I don't like the constant strain of email and email and email and email and email. People need answers. That's my job. That's what I'm going to do. But, you know, people have this funny notion that I've come and I've tried to do this thing for money. And let me just say this, and I've made this point before, you know, to those of you out there that say, Brian's in this for the money. Okay. If I'm in this for the money, why on earth would I preach to people that account for one of the smallest minorities on the planet. King James Bible believers are not the ones that you'd preach to if you wanted to make a lot of money. Okay? Um, if I wanted to make a lot of money, I'd preach to the modern Christians. I'd go and I'd be part of the modern mega church movement. I'd be a faith healer. Something like that. If, that, if money was my goal, that's what I'd do. Okay? Money's not my goal. Okay? And... Let me just say this in closing. If you want to invest in a ministry that is producing real spiritual fruit, then give to King James Video Ministries. You know, I've talked to plenty of brethren out there and they talk about how God has blessed them. You know, and there again, 
you send me a donation, a lot of people, uh, they send a donation and they aren't really expecting to hear anything. I thank everybody that ever sends me a donation. Why? That's just the way I was raised. I just believe in thanking people when they do something nice for me. So thank you to everybody out there that has given donations. I appreciate every single one of you. But uh, if you donate to this ministry, you'll see spiritual fruit, both here in this life and in heaven. All right? And I'm not saying you got to give, you know, tons of money. I mean, there's people that donate a dollar to the ministry. Praise the Lord. Hey, praise the Lord. You know, every little bit helps. Right? Help us to continue to stay in ministry. That's what the whole thing is about. You say, well, brother, I, I got to give my 10% to my church building. You know, well, you're putting 10% of your income into a building that the Antichrist is going to take over eventually. And that your hireling of a pastor, more than likely, is having to revive, you know, periodically just to keep up the membership. And, you know, a lot of these conservative, independent, fundamental Baptist churches, a lot of them are actually starting to go to worldly ways. You know, couples dinners and, and you know, uh, all these nice little fun events and things like that, family days and all that. Why? Why? Keep that money coming in. Keep those people coming in. Church has to be fun. You know, the church with a heart. We just love to be around people. You will love our church and we will love you back. Yeah. And a lot of these churches have no outreach at all. They're building. The lost are expected to come to the building to be saved. They don't go out after the lost like you're supposed to do in the Bible. You know? And those hirelings are going to run when the wolf comes. And the wolf is coming soon. So... If you want to donate to King James Video Ministries, we'll thank you in advance. If you don't, okay, don't. You know, go home to heaven. If you're a Christian, you say, I don't believe in tithing at all. I don't believe in giving anybody any of my money. Okay, then you'll go home and it'll only be your labors that you're rewarded for. If you donate to other ministries, and there's lots of good ones too. I mean, donate to Fellowship Track League. Donate to local church Bible publishers. Those are good ministries. You know, donate to them. They're getting the word out. They're publishing the word. Okay, the word of God will grow greatly by giving to those ministries. But you give to those guys, and you'll see that the seed that they're sowing and the fruit that they're reaping will actually come back to you at the judgment seat of Christ. It's a wise investment. Okay? So, that's going to be it for this morning. And I'm uh, not going to close with prayer in this video because we did with the other one. And it's starting to rain a little bit here. So I want to get my Bible covered up and everything. And that vehicle noise is driving me up a wall. So I've about had it with that. But uh, a lot of new sermon ideas coming out in the future. Um, right now, just as a little ministry update, uh, my wife are, and I are actively pursuing a property that we can buy. And... Uh, you know, you say, well, brother, I can't tithe money or anything right now. Okay, then why don't you give us 10% or 50% <laughs> of an hour and uh, pray for us. I'll tell you right now, if I had a choice between your money and your prayers, I'd pick your prayers every single time. We need your prayers uh, majorly, okay? There are days when we get attacked spiritually. Uh, it's not too much fun. Um, Satan's not real happy with my wife and I right now. Uh, you know, there's a lot of work being that we're getting done. And um, Satan's trying to stop us. And he's using a lot of the brethren to try and do it. But uh, <clears throat> false brethren mostly. But um, we need your prayers. Please pray that the Lord would open up a property for us, a place where we can go, where we can serve the Lord. Um, everything's still in limbo right now. You know, I can't really... Uh, I've, I need to make more DVDs. I need to make more things and, and stuff. I can't because you know, I'm only doing little batches at a time because of our temporary ministry address for right now. Uh, I want to go in and correct a lot of the sermon videos that I've done, you know, the address at the end. I can't until we get our permanent you know, residence. Um, you know, we're just really, really trying to find some land. Uh, we're trying to find it out in the mountains. 
um, because we love the mountains, first of all. Secondly, it's a lot cheaper. I mean, this property, just to tell you uh, how ridiculous things are, this property right over here, we heard how much they paid for it. It's a little over four acres of land. They paid $150,000 for it. So um, areas like this where we're preaching today, we can't preach. We can't live in this area. Uh, there's no way. No way. You know, uh, the kind of place we're looking for is a lot less money than this. And, you know, we're trying for that simply because we want to live, you know, debt free. So we're going to live as cheaply as we can. Um, we're going to live in a very, very, very small home. And as long as we can keep the ministry going, that's all our, our dreams are. Um, I'm not going to be rich here on this earth. I realized that a long time ago before I started the ministry. So my goal is not about money. It's not about getting rich. It's just about serving the Lord. And we want to try to do that uh, right up until the rapture. So to all that have donated, thank you. To all that pray for us, double thank you. Um, please keep praying uh, for the ministry. Please pray that the Lord leads us to that right property, um, blesses us with a place that we can afford. And um, I guess that's going to be it. So thank you so much for watching, and may the Lord Jesus Christ be with you this week.